Good evening, everyone. We're very glad to have you here on the fifth midweek service in Lent. I'm Pastor Nelson, I'll be conducting the service here at St. Luke's. We basically follow page 54 in the hymnal, but we abbreviate some of the things that are there. Our first hymn is hymn number 127, Stricken, Smitten, and Afflicted. <laughs> Dear Heavenly Father, as we gather together this evening to bring you praise and worship, we ask that you would continue to watch over us to bless that worship. We know that you are the King of the universe, and you led your people Israel with a pillar of cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night. Enlighten our darkness by the light of your Christ, and may his word be a lamp to our feet and a light to our path. For you are merciful, and you know your whole creation. We, your creatures, glorify you, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Please be seated for Psalm 6. If you're following along in the hymnal, it is on page 66. O 
O Lord, do not rebuke me in your anger. Or discipline me in your wrath. Be merciful to me, Lord, for I am faint. O Lord, heal me, for my soul is in anguish. Turn, O Lord, and deliver me. Save me because of your unfailing love. I am worn out from groaning. My eyes grow weak with sorrow. Away from me, all you who do evil. For the Lord has heard me. The Lord has heard my cry for mercy. The Lord accepts my prayer. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. Lord God, you are merciful and tender-hearted, abounding in love and faithfulness. Turn to us in our anguish over sin and hear our cry for mercy, that we may be at peace through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Passion reading for this evening is recorded in Mark chapter 14, verse 66, to Mark 15, verse 15. While Peter was in the courtyard below, one of the servant girls of the high priest came there. When she saw Peter warming himself, she looked directly at him and said, You were also with the Nazarene Jesus. But he denied it, saying, I don't know or understand what you are saying. And he went out to the entryway. Then a rooster crowed. When the servant girl saw him, once more she began to tell those standing there, This is one of them. But again he denied it. After a little while, those who were standing there said to Peter, Surely you are one of them, because you are a Galilean. Then he began to curse and to swear. I do not know this man you are talking about. Just then the rooster crowed for the second time. Then Peter remembered what Jesus had said to him. Before the rooster crows twice, you will deny me three times. And he broke down and wept. As soon as it was morning, the chief priests, along with the elders, the experts in the law, and the whole Sanhedrin, reached a decision. They bound Jesus, led him away, and handed him over to Pilate. Pilate asked him, Are you the king of the Jews? He answered him, It is as you say. The chief priests accused him of many things. Pilate questioned him again. Are you not going to answer anything? See how many charges they are bringing against you. But Jesus still did not answer anything. So Pilate was amazed. At each festival, Pilate used to restore or release to the people one prisoner whom they requested. There was one named Barabbas who was imprisoned with the rebels and had committed murder in the rebellion. The crowd came up and began to ask Pilate to do for them what he usually did. Pilate replied, Do you want me to release the king of the Jews to you? In fact, he knew that it was because of envy that the chief priests had handed him over. But the chief priests stirred up the crowd to have him release Barabbas to them instead. Again, Pilate replied to them, then what do you want me to do with the man you call the king of the Jews? Crucify him, they shouted back. But Pilate said to them, why? What has he done wrong? But they shouted even louder, crucify him. Since he wanted to satisfy the crowd, Pilate released Barabbas to them. After he had Jesus flogged, he handed him over to be crucified. This is our passion reading for tonight. We'll continue now with the seasonal response. 
All we like sheep have gone astray, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. By his wounds we are healed. We'll continue now with our next hymn, hymn number 110, of the Song of Love Unknown, verses 1 through 3, and then verse 7. God for our meditation this evening is recorded in Psalm 69, verses 29 through 33. But I am afflicted and in pain. O God, may salvation from you set me on high. I will praise God's name in song. I will proclaim his greatness with thanksgiving. For the Lord, this is better than an ox than a bull that has horns and hooves. The poor will see and be glad. You who seek God, may your hearts live. These are God's words. Last night I had the privilege of conducting the worship service at No Night, and Along with that worship service, the Sound Foundation singers from Luther High were there to take over about half of that service. So I had to make sure that my, me my message was short and concise and to the point. But today I can just go as long as I can. <laughs> we listened to their songs and we rejoiced that the message of salvation came out through those songs because they weren't just songs that could be sung at any time. They were songs that focused on God's saving plan of salvation. And as we heard those songs, and I have my sermon based on a psalm 
which is also a song that kind of all fit together very well for me. This evening we also have beautiful hymns. Our very first hymn of Jesus Christ, that is a hymn that a modern hymn writer would probably not ever think about writing because they're interested in, in praise and joyful music not God's plan of salvation. And so the verses that we have before us this evening are verses that have affliction, pain, poor, people that are distressed, downtrodden. And yet it has a song. And the song that is in there is a, a Savior's song of thanksgiving. And that song, Psalm 69, Written by David, David, inspired by God, is one of the messianic psalms. And so there are many applications to the life and ministry of Jesus, and especially to his passion, to his suffering, his death, and his salvation. When Jesus was first announced to Mother Mary by an angel, she was terrified but accepted that message humbly. And after the angel had gone, what did she do? She broke out in song, kind of a spontaneous song. It's still in our hymnal. We call it the Magnificat. It's a beautiful song, beautiful part of praise. And then when Zechariah, the father of the prophet John the Baptist, he was told by an angel, you're not going to be able to speak because you doubted what I was saying. The baby was born. The name was announced that it would be John. And it caused a little bit of an uproar because it wasn't a family name. And then the Lord gave Zechariah the power to speak. And his first words were, his name is John. And the words that followed that were another spontaneous hymn of praise, thankfulness to God that through God's plan of salvation, the forerunner of Jesus and Jesus himself, the Savior would bring salvation to the entire world. When Jesus was born, the shepherds were gathered the angels were gathered. The shepherds didn't do any singing. But the angels did. Glory to God in the highest. And the angel choir was very excited that the plan was now fully in place. It was in motion. And the Son of God, the King of the universe, would carry that plan out perfectly as the Lord had wanted so they sang. So singing has been something that's been a, a very important part of the Christian church. When the two older people saw Jesus when he was brought into the temple, Simon, or Simeon, and Anna, they also started to sing. That their eyes got to see salvation. Here's who it is. So it's no surprise that in the Old Testament Psalms, they focus a lot on our Savior, Jesus Christ. They may not mention him specifically by name, but they talk about him in all of his works and all of his actions. And David writes in inspiration, I will praise God's name in song. I will proclaim his greatness with thanksgiving. O oh God, may salvation from you set me on high. They sang about God's plan of salvation. They shared that plan of salvation. On the day of Pentecost, 50 days after Jesus' resurrection, there was a huge gathering of people from many, many countries, many, many different languages, and Peter and the remaining 10 apostles spoke to them, preached to them, 
shared God's message with them, and the entire audience heard the message that came from these men, these fishermen. They heard it in their own language. And that was just 10 days after Jesus had commissioned them to bring the gospel to all nations, to baptize and to forgive in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. And then Christian hymns began to be started because the Savior had come. And now we've got a specific individual to sing about. We have specific works to sing about. We have specific plans of God's salvation where he reveals salvation to us and he makes sure that everyone can know that through Jesus Christ, God is reconciling the world to him because Jesus has perfected our redemption. He's the ransom price for our redemption and our sins have been paid for. And this is the real hymn of praise that Jesus began with his life, with his ministry, and with his accomplishments. He glorified in everything he did. He glorified his Father's name. That was his purpose. Bring glory to his heavenly Father. And that's part of our purpose as well. Bring glory to God. Live in a way that brings glory to God. Speak in a way that does that. Even think in a way that brings glory to God. Other humans might not hear those thoughts, but God knows every one of them. And he knows when they're bringing him glory or when they are doing the exact opposite and deny everything that God has done for us. After the completion of his atonement, the Lord commissioned his disciples. And as they went out, they went out to all nations. They spread the gospel message. It, it took a little while for that to really get going. But when Paul became a convert, it really slipped into high gear. And Paul traveled throughout the world on his four mission journeys, and he did all that he could to share the message of salvation. And Christian traditions tell us that the other remaining faithful disciples also went out on their mission work and shared the good news of salvation. And so as they did that, our Savior is given glory, our Heavenly Father is given glory, and we learn to praise God's glorious name. What a blessing that is for each and every one of us that we are able to know all that God has done for us is a part of his entire plan for our future salvation and our resurrection from the dead. We learned through Jesus' resurrection that we have a new freedom and our eyes are open to see Jesus as our savior, our king, our prophet and priest. And while Jesus is hanging on the cross, there's the sign that's placed there. Jesus of Nazareth, the king of the Jews. I read about that in our reading from Mark today when Pilate and Jesus were having their conversation. And this is the shorter version of their conversation in the book of Mark. He was asked, are you the king of the Jews? And he clearly answered, yes. And from the other gospels, we know that as the questioning went on, he let Pilate know that his kingdom was not of this world. Because if it was, his disciples would have fought for him. And they would have won a victory for him because he would have been backing them up and making sure that that victory was certain. But his kingdom was not of this world. But that doesn't mean that he doesn't have a kingdom. He has a kingdom. He is our king. He will be coming back. Pilate made that sign partly because the words that Jesus spoke led him to write that and all of the trouble that the Pharisees and the chief priests and the enemies of Jesus were giving him about not letting Jesus go free when he knew there was no crime that would stick against him at all. 
And so he kind of you know, pushed it into him a little bit. You get to have him to crucify him, but this sign is going to be there. And people are going to look at that sign. Many people. They're going to look at Jesus and they're going to wonder about his kingship. Is he really king of the Jews? How can he be king of the Jews? Well, our psalm gives us some more information about what Jesus does to make sure that we know he is our king. The Lord is, for the Lord, this is better than an ox, than a bull that has horns and hooves. The poor will see and be glad. And you who seek God, may your hearts live. For the Lord listens to the needy, and he does not despise the captives who belong to him. The people who are there at the foot of the cross need Jesus, need him to pay for all of their sins, need him to be that perfect sacrifice, that ransom payment for all of our sins. And when Jesus died, there was evidence that this was a miraculous event. Dead rose from the graves around Jerusalem. In the temple itself, in the most holy of holies room in that temple that was separated from all the rest of the temple by a curtain and only the high priest could go in once a year to offer sins first for the people and then for himself. In that room, that curtain was torn down because the access was now fully open to us through Jesus our Savior. We can go right to him to call upon him in prayer. Call upon him with all of our needs. Call upon him when we feel that we are enslaved by sin, death, and the devil. When the world seems like it's about to overcome us and wipe everything out, God is there. Jesus is there. The king is there. And he's coming back. Amen. Please stand. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen. You may be seated now for the offering. And after the offering, we'll do our responsive prayer. closing hours of this day, hear us as we pray, O Lord. Lord, have mercy. For the well-being of people everywhere, for the growth of your church in all the world, and for strengthening of all who serve and worship here, we pray, O Lord. Christ, have mercy. For one another, young and old, for your blessings that come with every stage of life, and for joy in doing your will, we pray, O Lord. Lord, have mercy. For our public servants who work during the day and at night to bring protection, justice, learning, and health to this and every place, we pray to you, O Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. In thanksgiving for your many and varied gifts to us, we now commend ourselves to your care. Be our shield and strength, O Lord. Amen. We'll continue with the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. 
for the life is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Please be seated as we join in singing the first four verses of hymn number 588, Abide With Me. Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen. Our closing hymn is 588 verse 5 and 7.
Thank you all for coming this evening. We greatly appreciate it. And we look forward to seeing you again.